we'll get started if you guys want to grab your seats. <coughs> and then that way we'll give Dave as much time as he needs here to uh, take us through SQL Server tools. So. Welcome uh, to the November session. Is there anybody new that has never been here before? Awesome. Great. Well, welcome. Uh, have food. Uh, introduce yourself to people at the break and um, come up and see me and um, I can introduce you around. So uh, thank you so much to our full season financial sponsors. Uh, we have North Sale, we have Microsoft, and we have RL Solutions. Um, people who have already been here several times already know the, uh, the story behind this, that uh, we needed uh, full season sponsors to put this season on, and these three companies stepped up. So very uh, special thanks to them to um, make sure that they can we could deliver this year's sessions, uh, which is excellent. As well, a special thank you to our swag sponsors. Uh, these people have been sponsoring us for the past couple of years. We actually introduced a new sponsor this month called PostSharp. PostSharp uh, does compiler extensions for C Sharp and VB. They reached out to one of our volunteers and asked if they could sponsor us. Uh, we said, great, um, that would be awesome. And so they're gonna give licenses as well as Starbucks gift cards. Uh, so I have two of those to give away today. So we'll uh, give away those at the end of the session. As well, uh, if you're, you or your company would like to sponsor CTVB Nug, we're always looking for session sponsors, especially to provide pizza pop, drinks, uh, pay for the rooms, all of that kind of stuff. They're always welcome, so feel free to reach out to us at the email address at the bottom there. As well, uh, your feedback is important. When uh, Microsoft and these companies look to see whether they should sponsor us, they're always looking for their feedback, for the session comments, um, what the, and especially the speakers like to hear uh, what they're doing great at and what they can improve upon. So anything that you could uh, leave, any kind of feedback, is uh, especially appreciated by both us and the speakers. Is there anybody in the room that's looking for work or is hiring that would like to stand up and say a few words? Yes, Peter. Hi, I'm finishing up a contract with Manulife at the end of the month. I'm a C-sharp and SQL programmer with like, 20 years experience and interested in working in the Kitchener Waterloo area if possible. Uh, if anyone has an opportunity that might be suitable, come talk to me at the break. Thank you, Peter. Does anybody else want to say a few words? Good. Awesome. All right. All right, so a few upcoming events. Um, we're still planning our sessions for January. Uh, just a quick reminder again, there will be no December sessions. We tend to take the December off. Generally, the weather's kind of bad. We uh, also would like to give that time back to our members so they can spend time with their families. So uh, please stay tuned. There will be January sessions upcoming. They, those announcements will be uh, in your inbox shortly. Uh, Microsoft, our Mississauga.net uh, user group, uh, they're holding a session to, uh, on the 29th, uh, Intro to Deep Learning, and uh, there's already a bunch of people, there's 40 people going, there are some people on the waiting list, as with most user groups, if you get on the waiting list and you really want to go, you can probably just show up and grab a seat. Um, Obi's pretty good about having people come to his group. Uh, Toronto.net meetup, DevOps in the real world, Max uh, is going to present something on the 28th, so if you're downtown Toronto and you want to check that group out, that group is a very, um, very active group, they always get a lot of people, uh, good Q&A, so if you want to meet a very diverse and dynamic group, go check them out. As well as, uh, well, WitPro's got two uh, sessions that they've, that they've announced, uh, they're taking uh, December off as well, but on November 27th, they're going to talk about Cloud Ready. Uh, Office 365 versus Azure, not sure what Honolulu is, but uh, they're going to talk about Xenos. And then in January 29th, they're going to actually be talking about JIRA. They just announced that one. So if you work with JIRA and you want to know more about that, either as an administrator or as a developer, you might want to check that session up. That's January 29th. And finally, uh, Microsoft Tech Summit. So if you haven't signed up for it already, please check it out. It's uh, last year's session, last year's conference was really awesome. Again, this is free to attend. It's at the convention center. Free lunch, free breakfast, all the sessions are free. Check them out. You can register online um, at Microsoft.ca or Microsoft.com uh, Tech Summit. There's the link right there. There's also a short bitly links floating around the uh, Twitter sphere. So. so without further ado, uh, please welcome Dave Lloyd. Dave has spoken here, geez, I think probably every year for the last three or four years at least. At least more than that. Yeah, and then, you know, intermittently beyond that. So uh, Dave reached out and said that he had a great uh, talk to talk today about SQL Server data tools. I said, yeah, our, um, in our last two surveys, uh, people have requested um, more sessions on SQL, so this worked out perfectly for us. So um, please give Dave a warm welcome. Hey, how's everybody doing? Good, thank you. Good, good. good. 
Uh, yeah, I've been. Out, I have a bunch of familiar faces. Has anybody seen me speak here before? A few people. Yeah, I thought there was a few familiar faces. In the crowd. Um, I haven't been out for a while though, uh, and something interesting happened to me since the last time I was here. Uh, I became a grandfather, twice. So I just made a slide deck up with pictures of my granddaughters. Uh, I am the ALM practice lead at uh, Object Sharp, one of the founding partners of Object Sharp in Toronto. Uh, I've written courses, I've been writing software for, I hate to say it, about 35 years and I've been teaching people how to write software for about 30 of those years. Um, so I've been around the block a few times. Uh, I am not a DBA, I'm doing a SQL Server talk, but I'm not a DBA because I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, SQL Server from a developer's point of view. All right, so we're going to talk a bit about SQL Server data tools. How many people here have a SQL Server database that they have to deploy? How many people are using SQL Server data tools? Nice. To do complete continuous integration and delivery? Beautiful. I got one nod. I have one smiling person nodding over there. <laughs> so you're going to know all this stuff, then. Yeah, we'll see, right? There's always something you can learn. <laughs> and there's always something you can learn. Okay. So. Um, to kind of set the stage a little bit, for those of you that aren't familiar with SQL Server data tools and, and what it's all about, uh, the whole idea is turning your database into a data tier application. Um, what you want to do is, is treat the database just like you would a C -sharp .net app or a Java app or any app. You know, apply all the same processes uh, and apply the same tools as well. So you know, get version control, get that database into version control, uh, set up automated unit tests, do continuous integration, do continuous delivery, uh, do builds, do static code analysis, write unit tests, all that stuff can be done on a SQL Server database using SQL Server data tools. So I'm going to show you how to do all, a whole bunch of it. We're going to, most of this is demo, and I got a handful of slides just to kind of set things up a bit, but um, I'm going to take you through a bunch of demo and we're actually going to go into Visual Studio and just try out a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I love a very interactive audience, so please you know, throw out questions and let's chat and tell me if I'm wrong and I always learn something when I do one of these talks, so I'm counting on that tonight. I'll learn something from you guys as well. So what we want to do is turn um, our database into a data tier application. So you're sitting there thinking to yourself, yeah, well, how are you going to do that? It's a database. You know, I, I spin up SQL Server Management Studio and I write procs and everything's right in the database. How am I going to get it over into version control? Have I got to save that thing out? and you know, is this a real pain in the butt? Well, no, it's not. It can, you can use SQL Server Data Tools plugs right into uh, Visual Studio and gives you an SSMS-like interface. So I can do everything right inside Visual Studio. You can still do it in SSMS if you want to. So what do you know what I, I you throw I'm going to, you know, like we all do, we throw around acronyms, but I don't want to leave anybody out who's not sure what those are. So SSMS is SQL Server Management Studio, which is Microsoft's tool for uh, working with SQL Server, um, and SSDT is SQL Server Data Tools. Uh, SQL Server Data Tools allow you to create what's called a SQL project, and for those that have been around for a little while, I don't want you to get that confused, you might have at one point seen a DB project in Visual Studio. Back in 2010, I think it was, there was a DB project. That is, they are not the same thing. They did some of the same things, they tried to be the same thing. The problem was the DB project wasn't written by the SQL Server team. It was written by somebody else at Microsoft who said, hey, we should be doing this with databases. And the SQL Server team said, well, hold on, if you're going to write tools for SQL Server, we should be writing them. So they said, abandon that DB project thing. We like your ideas, though. We'll take what you've got, and we're going to write SQL data for a SQL project. So you may have seen a DB project. You may even still have one hanging around, hard to say. Uh, but you can, you can move that over into a, a, a SQL project. So with that SQL project, now, it, it's actually uh, inside a Visual Studio solution. It's a Visual Studio project. And I can do, uh, I can edit objects in there, I can create objects. So when I say write, when I right click on the project and say add, you know, instead of getting uh, a class, I get table or store procedure or trigger or function. So I can add that stuff right inside, right from within my project. I can check those objects in and out of source control. Um, I can validate the code outside of SQL Server, so I can actually build that project or compile it and make sure that my stored procs, for example, aren't referencing uh, columns that don't exist in the tables. So it'll actually compile the project for me. 
Um, and I can, I can, from there, compare to a physical database. So I can do a schema compare and see what the difference is between source control and a database. So how many people write alter scripts to do their deployments now? So stop that. There's, there's tools that will do that for you. You don't need to be doing that. The number of places that I go into, um, and invert they say, and I, you know, I ask, them, they want to know about SQL Server data tools, and I say, well, do you keep your, you know, do you store the database in version control? Yep, yeah, we do. And uh, oh, is it in a SQL project? Mm, I don't know. I don't know what that means. And then you go look at their version control, and they show you, and what they've got in version control is just all the scripts in order that you would have to run to make this database. So if they ever wanted to go and create version whatever of the database from a particular date, they would have to start from scratch and run those things all in order, or know the state of the database and run the ones that need to apply to get to there. And trying to keep track of that is just an absolute nightmare. With SQL Server data tools, I can point, I can, I can take my, um, what I've got in version control, and I can compare that to any database, my dev database, my QA database, which could be at different points, and probably are at different points. And if, if you're not using tools like this, they're probably at very different points, and, that, and not because you want them to be. Uh, and I can point to that database, and I can uh, run a tool that will generate a script for me that will update that database to be the same as my version control. And we're going to take a look at how to do that, and there's, and there's a couple of different APIs that we can use. There's a command line tool called uh, SQL Package, and there's another, uh, there's a tool in uh, SSDT uh, for doing DAC operations. So you can write this, I write them in PowerShell usually, because I happen to like PowerShell, but you can do it in just about anything you want to. Um, this is just a really quick, for anybody's reference, I'm not going to dwell on it at all, but uh, essentially, um, supported versions of SQL Server, uh, you know, for the most part from 2005 up to 2016, you can do this kind of stuff with some caveats, of course. There's always caveats back in the older versions. Um, <clears throat> and SQL Server Data Tools has two flavors. There's SSDT and there's SSDT BI. So if you're using uh, analysis services or uh, integration services or reporting services, there's a separate set of tools for that that allow you to do the same kind of stuff. And they're available in from 2008 up, or 2012 up, is for integration services. Did I hear somebody? I thought we had a question there. So those are the versions of, data, of SQL Server that we can use. So <clears throat> some of the stuff that uh, I want to talk about, or I'm going to take you in and demo to you, is I'm going to show you how you kind of get started. So how do I, I've already got a database. I'd love to start using these tools, but you know, how am I going to get that database into my SQL Server project as a starting point? Am I going to sit and write, you know, SQL for everything? And uh, no, you don't. I'm going to show you how to import one. Uh, we'll take a look at versioning, um, uh, how to turn it on, how to set it up as a data tier application, and what that actually uh, means. Uh, we'll talk about code analysis, compiling, creating the published profile, which is really important because that's all the arguments or that's all the things that you need to. Um, tell SQL package how you want to deploy the database. Uh, we'll do a schema compare, and we'll take a look at writing some unit tests. Sound good? And then, um, you guys take breaks, don't you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't let my user group take a break, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so I'll, I'm going to try and do this before, the, what time do you usually break at? Whenever you're ready, about 7.15, 7.20. Oh, so I am in control of that. Yeah. Fantastic. So, <clears throat> I like the little fake power that you get from things like that. Um, so I'm going to try to do this part before the break, and then when we come back from the break, um, I'm going to go into VSTS, and we're going to take a look at an automated build and automated deployment of the database. Okay? Sound good? Anybody want to leave? All right, you're still with me? I am glad. Okay, uh, let's get into... So, <clears throat> I got a little VM here. Um, that I'm going to do everything in, so hopefully it behaves for me. Uh, let's uh, let's start with import. Uh, I'm going to just go and create a new um, SQL project. So when you've got, if you're using SQL, or, uh, Visual Studio 2015 or 2017, SSDT is, comes out of the box with it. It's built right in. Anything prior to that, so if you're using 2013, 2012, or 2010, or God forbid, 8 or 5 or 3 or something else like that, uh, you're going to need to go and download 
the appropriate version of SSDT and install it. Uh, SQL Server SQL Server team always has a challenge keeping up with, or I shouldn't blame them. Or maybe they're ahead of the Visual Studio team. I don't know. But they're never always in sync, as you know. Um, so, you know, I know, for example, in Visual Studio 2012, if you were using SQL Server 2012, you had to use Visual Studio 2012 and SSDT 2012 to work with it. But since 2015, they've kind of broken the chains of that. And now it's just a matter of going into your SQL Server project and targeting this version of SQL Server, and it works very well. So uh, under my templates, I've got SQL Server. So let's just make a, uh, uh, an import demo database. I'm not going to put it in version control or anything. I've got one already set up for us that we can play with. Uh, but I just wanted to show you how to do the import. So it's going to create um, a project for me. Go to my solution GPS explorer. Uh oh. <laughs> now we don't know where to go. And then I'm just <laughs> so I've got my uh, my import demo SQL proj, uh, and if I went and looked, it's actually a dot SQL proj file instead of a you know db proj or a c sharp proj or a db proj. Um, and if I right click on the project and go to import, um, I can import straight from, I can import a script. So if I had a script that had all these objects in it, I could just pull that in. So, you know, that is one option. You could script out from the database and then pull it in from the script. Um, <clears throat> or if you already had a DAC pack, you could, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. To create a DAC pack, you've got to build a project that generates a DAC pack. We'll talk about that in a minute. So I'm not really sure how this one would work, but. Uh, but we can go directly right after a, a database as well. So I'm going to just select a connection, and I'll just pick my I'll pick my local one, my local dev box version for now. Uh, and I'm going to there's a couple of settings here. I'm going to turn off reference logins. So all I'm going to import is uh, application scoped objects. I'm not getting permissions in that. We can have some you know as you guys learn more about this, we can have some great philosophical discussions of what you keep. In a SQL, you're smiling because you've been through this a bit, right? What you keep in a SQL Server project. I mean, there's a lot of objects in a SQL Server database, and a lot of them, we, you know, we really don't need them in version control. But people get, you know, we can we can discuss that. Now, so, um, yeah. Can you give an example of something that's important enough to be on the database server, but not important enough to be in source control? Like a user, or um, role membership permissions. So those things are specific to the environment that they're in, not to the code. They're, think of them almost, uh, right, they're, they're, they are objects in SQL Server, and I can certainly script them out, and I can store them in version control, and I can, but if I, if I pull all the users out, then every time I deploy, all those users are going to deploy to that database, and I might have taken a user out of there. I would have to take them out of version control. And the users will be different and potentially have different version or different permissions depending on whether it's the dev database or the QA database or the, and I'm sure there's a few more than that, but those are kind of the obvious ones that I think of. Make sense? Yep. Um, so the, down the bottom here, we've got our folder structure, and I'm very OCD with stuff like this. So I, I, like, I like the default, which is schema object. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna make a DBO folder, and in that folder, there's gonna be a folder that says what's in the next folder, so it's like programmability. And under that, store procedures, functions, and another one for tables, and it just organizes everything. I don't have to do it that way. Um, I can have no structure and all the objects just sort of go into the, yeah, I know, make a face terrible. Uh, or I can just do it by schema, or I can just do it by object type. I like the whole schema. I'll show you what it looks like now when you see it. Um, but it's up to you. You can pick however you want to do it. So it's going up to that database, and hopefully it's going to just pull everything in for us. The import of database, there we go. Well, that took a second. So there we go, we've got everything. Now if you look over here at my project, all this did was pull all the objects out of the database and shove them into my project for me. So now I never really need that tool again. From now on, I will do everything inside this project, and this, this is my, where my database lives now. Right, the source of my database, the schema. So you can see my that database pretty small. It's only got about five tables and two store procedures. We don't want a big long one, or we'll be sitting here for ages. I've tried pulling in some really big databases, and it can it can take a while. So that's kind of a starting point, right? Pull in that database you want to start using uh, SSDT with. 
And now you've got something that I can add. I can take this thing and add it to source control. And now I've, you know, I, this is where this is where my database now lives. So I'm going to actually close that guy out and open up another one in a minute because it's got a few extra things in it that we can look at. So some of the stuff that you can do now this does. You know, it just looks like a C-sharp project, right? It's got you know, properties and you can make references to things. Um, and it's got all its objects. And uh, if I go into the properties, there's a bunch of things that you want to kind of pay attention to in here. Um, one of them uh, is, let's find my, well actually, this is an interesting one and kind of an obscure one. I like to version my database. So I have a PowerShell script that in my automated build, I grab the build number and I throw it into the database, and I, I set that version of, of um, I set the build number on into the DAC pack so that when it's deployed, it ends up with that version number. So I know what version of the database, what I can go back to version control and say, this is the code, or these, this is the schema for that particular database exactly. So it's no different than if it was code, right? I want to be able to. Um, put a version number on my DLL, so when I'm looking in version, or in production, and something's happening, I can look at that DLL and I can go back to version control and see exactly which build created that, or which source code created that. Um, so an interesting thing about this though, you'll notice I've got it set to 1.1.0.0, .1 um, and that's because in uh, inside the project, so this is a SQL project file, it's just XML, right? Let them know where they are. And when it's set to 1.0.0.0, there is no version number in here. So as soon as you change that number to something, it adds this thing at the called DAC version. You can see it, unfortunately, it's down at the bottom of the screen, but you see the DAC version gets added. And it's mostly just laziness, but so instead of my little PowerShell script that sets the version number, instead of me adding a DAC version, what I do is I always just go into my project. And I set the version to 1.1.0, which, so Visual Studio actually shoves in that DAC version, and then I've got something to change when I set the version. Lazy silliness, but it works for me. Um, some other things that I can do in here, um, I can set the version. So you want to set the target version of SQL Server that you're going to. Um, I'm actually... For convenience, I've set up three databases in Azure, so I'm doing um, Azure SQL databases. Um, but if they're on-premise databases or even hosted or whatever, you can just, if it's 2012, 2008, whatever, you just change your project to the version of the server because it will make a difference on how it behaves, how it compiles, what it does, okay? And no distinction here between 2008 and R2? No, there isn't. Care. Okay. I, I guess not. For the purposes that we're doing here, I'm. To be honest, I, I would have thought there was, there would have been, because they're a fairly distinct upgrade. But you know, there's no. So from the point of view of schema code, I guess not. Um, the other thing that we can do within here, let me just close up the tests and open up these guys. Um, if I open up one of these. Now, if I wanted, so I've got editors built right into Visual Studio for tables, store procedures, everything, right? And, you know, when people say, well, yeah, but I want to I want to test my stored proc. I want to write it, and I want to run it into the database and then execute it. Well, that's great. I mean, you can, so you can treat this like you would an, a, a, an application, right, for continuous integration and continuous delivery in that I make a change to my proc, I, I can... I can certainly run it in the database and, and try it out on my local machine, but when I check it into version control and run my build and execute my unit tests, that's going to do all that. Right? It's going to build it, it's going to run it in the database that, in the environment that I want it to, and then it's going to execute my tests against it. I'll show you how to, I've got a couple of tests in here that are a little bit silly, but you'll get the idea. Um, but if I wanted to run it, you'll also notice I get this SQL menu item up here, and up there is an execute. So I can actually run this stored proc right into a database. And, I, and then I could open up another window and, and do an execute and try it out and see if it works. So now you're all wondering, well, yeah, but what database is it running it in? Anybody wondering that? How does it work? Yeah. <laughs> is, is it? Well, then I'll show them. Um, that's, so if over in the project or in the uh, properties, 
If you go down to debug right here, there is a target connection string. And you can change this, just you know, pick if I want to go against QA, I can just swap that out. So whatever wherever that connection string is pointing is where anything I run in the project will execute. So generally you're gonna point that at a dev database because you're gonna execute stuff in dev. Right? No different than if I had an application that has a connection string that has to point to a database, I'm gonna be pointing it at my dev database. So it's just like having it in a config file. Make sense? So far so good? Um, so many people know what static code analysis is. Did you, that's not very many people. So, okay, so static code analysis is uh, a tool that lets you validate your code for coding standards. So it'll go through your Java app, and there's, there's tools for multiple different platforms. So you know, C Sharp, VB, Java, everything. I think even Cobol has a <coughs> static code analysis tool. Um, and you, uh, when you execute the tool against it, it will come back and give you warnings about things. So, and there's, there's sort of buckets of tools. There's things like you can check for globalization and make sure that you haven't got any strings that need to be translated. Or you could, it could be a naming convention on, on an object. Um, the, the, the story kind of goes way, way back. Anybody ever heard of a tool called FXCOP? So FXCOP is, a, is the .NET code analysis tool. Uh, it was written by, internally by Microsoft after a release of something. I can't remember how many times I've told the story. Um, and uh, essentially, somebody did some analysis and said, well, you know, about 70% of the bugs that we found during the deployment of that version of Windows or Office or whatever it happened to be at the time um, could have been avoided had the developers followed coding standards. So then somebody said, well, we can make them follow coding standards. We'll just write a tool that validates the code as following coding standards because it's a static check. We don't need to compile or anything. So, somebody wrote this tool called FXCOP and then they made it available and then eventually it got built right into um, .NET projects. So you can do it in C Sharp and in VB.NET and F Sharp and all the other uh, products. Well, you can also do that um, same thing in SQL Server. Everybody know you can do that? Anybody know you can do this? One person. Um, so if you, go to, if you open up the properties and go down to code analysis, you'll see there's a, there's a set of tools that you can validate some coding standards against. So stuff like, you know, avoid select star. We don't want select stars in our, so let's let's try one here. Let's see if we can get a. Is this SQL cop? Or uh, is this distinct? Is it SQL cop or is it distinct? I don't know. Can somebody answer that? I don't think it's SQL cop. I don't remember. I know I have it on my list of things that I need to look at, so I think it's not because I look at this one already. I don't think this one is SQL code. I think I have a, a SQL, SQL code as something that's different. Yeah. Okay. So I just broke one of my rules by putting in a select star and I'll just compile this. And I should get a, on my error list. Did I not get a. Oh, you probably need to tell it to run uh, code analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, you do. <laughs> See, I, yeah, I thought I already did that. Obviously not. Okay, so let's rebuild. Do, do, do. And hopefully, there we go. So it just caught the fact that I have a select star in there and, and it gives me a warning to say, hey, make sure you can also treat the warning as an error if you really want to, right? You can say, oh, we definitely don't want that. So uh, it's the same, um, and notice too, I'm doing, so I'm working here with the stored proc, and I'm just going to undo my pending change because it's just in version control, just like my code would be. Anything else. Um, so let's just recompile that, make sure everything's good. Uh, yeah, so, so you can just go into the project uh, properties, turn on code analysis. Um, What's the, uh, is it, is it Redgate? I want to say Redgate. Is that the SQL tool, the, the really popular one? Yeah. 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 Uh, I believe they have an even more pronounced list of rules built into their static code. It's very expensive. It is very expensive. <laughs> yes, this is the, I already have an MSDN subscription yeah. version. 
it's actually fairly better in a certain aspects. We did a whole review of a, a bunch of tools, and one of them was RedGay. And yes, a few things were like, well, this one is we already have it, but it is enough, powerful enough that you don't really need RedGay. Right. I've been told that lots of times. I've uh, I used RedGate on one project a long time ago, <laughs> very long time ago, uh, and it is good. I mean, it's yeah, yeah, very cool tool. But yeah, this is you know you've got this built in. Um, let me just go back to my list. I don't want to miss anything. Oh, wrong one. Um, so code analysis. We talked about the version of SQL Server. Um, we want to be. Uh, Compiling, skip right, right. Okay, so um, you'll notice a couple of times I've come in here and just said uh, rebuild solution, and that's because I'm actually compiling my my database. So it's just going through and validating to make sure that you know I'm not doing anything stupid in here. That I don't have uh, a sort proc that's referencing a column that's got that doesn't exist in the table uh, before I ever try to run it in a database. And if we go in and take a look. Um, at the folder structure, you'll see just like a regular app, I've got a bin folder and a debug folder because I'm building another debug. And when I build, what I get is this backpack. So Northwind backpack is the is the binary representation of my database. That's my my build artifact. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that for a minute. We're gonna come back and talk about that in a little bit more depth. We'll unpack one and take a peek inside and see what's what's in there and, and do a little bit more with it. Um, the other thing that you can do, uh, for anything that's programmable in SQL Server, um, I can right click on it and say create unit test. And when I do that, it will actually generate, I don't want to go through it all and make you guys watch it do that because it's pretty dull and insignificant. But essentially it says, oh, okay, well, what do you want to write them in? You know, do you want to do C Sharp or VB.net and do you want to put, um, what's the name of the project and that kind of stuff. And so I've generated um, a set of unit tests. And if I open it up and take a look, you can see I've got a unit test that just calls my, um, uh, my get customer store procedure. And it validates, you look down here at the bottom, it validates that one, uh, based on how I called it, I'm expecting one rollback. So I can just validate stuff like that. If I go in and take a look here, there's a bunch of things that I can check. So I can do a data check sum, empty, check for empty result sets, test for execution time. Uh, so you could have a test that just makes sure that a particular store procedure called in this way always comes back under a certain amount of time. And just make that one of your unit tests. If that's something that we're you know, worried about, then you'll find out through the regular build process or your deployment into dev whether that's still working right. I have a question. Does someone have to remember to come in and drop down a list or is that something we can set up in a config so it always happens? No, so what you do, so you'd actually, so this is a test that I've already built. Okay. So if I if I came in and said, watch, if I wanted to, if I wanted to add a new test, I hit this little add test, so I can just say uh, get customer two. So now I've got, this is a brand new test and I'm going to pass in a different customer ID and right now you'll notice down here when I create a new test what it does is it just returns um, an inconclusive from the test. So if I ran this it would just say this test is inconclusive. We're not validating. There's no assertion. We're not validating anything yet. So what I would want to do is, and I find this the worst user interface ever. So this is what it defaults to. I remove that. Oh, I think I have to add one before I can remove it. So I go back to my inconclusive, remove it, and then what I've just done is added a checksum. So whatever one of these I pick, so I could add, I could look at a row count. So you can actually check multiple assertions against this one execution, right? So I can say, okay, I expect there to be one row return, and um, or I expect it to return the value ten. So. And I don't mean to be rough here, but no, uh, go for it. My team is not great about remembering, and they resent when they're asked to do the same thing 15 times. So uh, I guess what I'm getting at is, can I turn this thing loose? 
and somewhere in the config define I always want for every store procedure oh. to see these four unit tests. You, yeah, you want a generic test framework then. You just, right? Like you want you want something that, that automatically executes a, no, you'd have to write something to do that. Okay. You'd have to write something to gen that code. Indeed. Wouldn't be real tough to do though. Yep. Um, do you have to, like in this particular example, do you have, is there a way to pre-populate test data? Or do you have to just know the values? No, you would need, so that would have to be, that would either be part of your deployment mm -hmm. into whatever environment, uh, or yes, mm -hmm. you would need to know what values are already in the test database, yeah. Now, well, I say that, you can do this though. So if you look up top here, so I, this is my get customer too. So see, I've got, a, I've got a get supplier test and I've got a get customer test. And for each one of those tests, there is, there is the test, but if in here, I've got a pre and a post. So you could do some setup in that pre and post, but now you're, you're dealing with it as, you're maintaining that as part of your test, right? right. So you could do that, yeah. Yeah, if you just wanted to make sure that, like if it was insurance and you wanted to make sure that a certain policy was in the system, you know, it's not always so easy just to push a policy <laughs> into a system, right? There's a lot that goes on, so, yeah. Are those tests transactional? They, I think it depends on how you write the, the SQL in here, so it could be. I think that's, a pre oh, you mean with the pre and post? Yeah, like the whole thing runs a transaction. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Ayana, do you know? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't. Good question. I'll have to look that one up and find out. Um, so yeah, so, um, and the other kind of funny thing, so let's say it was a scalar, scalar test, and I added that in. This is something that I didn't find intuitive. So I'll, I'll point you there. So it's looking for a particular value, but there doesn't seem to be anywhere here to put the value. So what you gotta do is go to properties, and over here, there's the uh, expected value. So if I'm expecting it to return a 10, then I put that in the properties of that, the properties of the, in true Microsoft, they love their property window, right? I mean, anytime I got an object and they can throw up that property window to save writing a form, then they do it, so that's what they've done. So every, for each one of these assertions, there's a set of properties. Now some of them, you know, you don't, there's nothing additional to set, but when you're checking a scalar value, you need to be able to say what is the value that I'm looking for. So, let me just get out of here and not save this. So in the meantime, now I've got, um, I'm gonna undo these changes just so I don't break my. Hey, there's no way to uh, just have it more of a C sharp like unit test where you basically get more of a script kind of. Uh... <clears throat> well, the, sure, there is. You could, you could, um, so these are actually SQL written, and it's a C-sharp unit test that, that just runs the SQL. So if you think, think about it this way, um, if I'm a C-sharp developer, which I am, I'm more comfortable writing, doing some ADO.net stuff and writing uh, what you're saying, write my tests in C-sharp and run them as unit tests that way against my, um, against my database. These are more, think about, you know, for the, the data, the DBA database folks who are not traditional developers who don't know C Sharp, they know T SQL, and they know T SQL as well as we know C Sharp. So they want to write their tests in T SQL. So that's what this is for. It gives them a way, it, it builds a little framework around the T SQL unit tests so they can run uh, in Visual Studio and with a build or with a release, actually. It would have to be a release. Um, but I can write them in T SQL. So yeah, you certainly could. You could you could just as easily you could validate uh, a database by writing C sharp code for sure. For but sure. it's slow. I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we look over here, I've got my my um, test well, test explorer. I'm not done saying that, and I can run those two tests that I that I created. And go there. They're passing. Yay. Are you familiar with TSQLT? TSQLT? Yeah, the yeah. unit test framework. So I think Red Day built the tool on top yep. of it. So my question, if you had been familiar with it, is would I have to include TSQLT in my um, database 
import in order to write unit tests yes. using that framework. Is that framework based on it lives SQL objects? It lives in the SQL. database? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's transactional. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, out. yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to... I'll find out. You, yeah, you can execute. So, you know, if they're part of the database, they're going to get deployed with the database. Then it's just a matter of executing that SQL. Is it not? I mean, I'm assuming there's meth, there's some, are they stored, are they written in stored products? No, they live in their own schema. I'm uncomfortable thinking that my tests would ever be promoted beyond dev, so I'll keep working. I'll figure okay. it out. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, they don't have to, I, I'm not saying they necessarily need to go into production, but they would if they were in that. Oh, no, 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 I can, I can pick and choose what happens from environment to environment. So I'd love to see how that happens. Oh, okay, Thank then. You. Stay with me. <laughs> Um, well, the GPS isn't working, so we're <laughs> yeah, where else are you going to go? Where else can we possibly go? Um, so another little trick that you can do in here um, is a schema compare. So uh, actually, let's let's add a couple of things, shall we? Let's do let's do some stuff. Um, so because we're in a Visual Studio project, uh, I'm going to shrink up my tests and be done with those for a minute. I'm just going to say actually, let's go into tables. And I'm going to say add a new table. And I'm going to add a provinces table because over here in the VSCS, somebody assigned a story to me that says we need a new prov we need a provinces table in our uh, database. So I've got that assigned to me. I better I better go work on that. So um, I'm going to create a, create a provinces table. And let's just give it a, um, let's call it code, not ID. Um, and we'll make it a char. they're all two, right? And we'll give it a name, and we'll make that Prince Edward Island 30, I think, enough for PEI. If it's not, we'll just call it PEI. <laughs> it's our database. Um, Okay, so I've created myself a table. Um, I can make changes. Let's make a change to the store prog here too. Um, do, do, do. And let's bring back a uh, phone number as well. Why are you not? Why is it? What's that? License. License. Your 30 day trial has expired. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that's what it is? Well, once you log in, it won't. <laughs> Oh, it does too. Okay, let's not let's not go there. Yeah, we'll we'll leave that out. Okay, so I've made a couple of changes um, in Visual Studio, and I want to compare to my dev database to see what the changes are. Matter of fact, nobody's asked this question yet, and I'm sure it will come up eventually. But it's kind of a how many people use tools like Irwin or Power Designer to design? They've got a data architect that designs their database structure now. Nobody. That's good. I'm okay with that. Don't. I'm not. Trust me. I'm not judging. I think it's. I think they're overused. Um, but we. I run into a lot of companies who still have a, a a data architect, and they're using Irwin or something to design the database. And then I've got a whole team of people using SQL Server data tools to build and deploy databases. And they go, Well, how are we going to get into that? How are we going to get? I get this giant Irwin model and I'm making changes to the database, so how am I going to get those into... So, um, what, what we do with them a lot of the time is we have, because they can run from Irwin straight into a database, so we get them to deploy into their own little database. So we have this little database, that's just for them, it's on their own server, uh, nobody else can touch it but them, and then they can come in and use the schema compare to do stuff like this. So the schema compare lets me pick a database, so you'll notice my source, so I've got on one side I've got the source, and my source is actually what's in version control. And then I've got a target, and the target is a physical database in SQL Server. And I'm just going to say compare, and it will tell me the differences between them. So it's going to say, and this is what we're going to use later, this is sort of the manual UI version of the tool. We're going to use this for our continuous delivery later on, the, the same underlying tools. <clears throat> so we'll get that data architect to build, um, to 
uh, run it out into a database, and then they can do a schema compare against version control, right? So they just set their their source is the database, the target is version control. They can compare. It shows you what all the differences are, organize them by um, adds, deletes, and changes, and then they can go through that and make sure that everything's good and this is what they want in version control, and then they just say update, and it pushes it into version control and they check it in. Everybody else does a get latest and they've got the latest code or the latest version of the database. So it works pretty well. It's unfortunate that the tools can't connect straight to version control, but that kind of thing might come along and say, hey, yeah. Will this do, like, with provinces being a, a reference table, can you do role level compare? So this isn't data. No, not the data, okay. This is not data. data. So that's fantastic. I should have a prize. <laughs> I need a prize because um, when we think of databases, we think of the data. I mean, that's what a database does, right? Um, none of this stuff is data. Now, the province table is a code table. Um, so I can create in my project, I'll show you how to do this, I can create um, a post-deployment script that will execute, what will happen is when I, when I deploy the database, if I can write a script that has the, the province's data in it, what I, but I need it to be able to run any time because this is DevOps. I want to be able to, I want to, be able to run this on, a, on an empty database or production. So therefore, when I get to that prop, when I get to that script, I need to be able to get rid of everything in provinces and then add it back because I don't know what changed. I don't want to write an ultra script. But you could. You could make that post deployment an ultra script. Do a difference. What's that? Do a difference. Sure. There's lots of ways to do this. Yeah. So you could do differences. You could. Uh, I've got one customer that has, I'll show you an example of the script if I can find one. Um, they have a database that is nothing but code tables. It's used by a whole bunch of different systems, um, websites, the mainframe, uh, just tons and tons of different systems use this SQL Server database that's full of just codes. Um, and it's a pain in the butt to maintain this thing and to figure out exactly where you are and what's, what data we've put into which uh, database, you know, in QA dev, you know, you've got three or four databases across and then that's in every stream of development that's going on. So there could be a dozen databases we're trying to figure out what we've got where. Um, so now they now keep it all in version control. And so all the schema of all the tables is in there just like this. There are no stored procs in this thing. Um, but it's got, a, it's got a giant, it's got a folder full of scripts, one for every table that is just inserts. It's just insert after insert. Some of them are like thousands of lines long. And then there's a post deployment script that just calls all those. And at the very top, it calls a system proc that drops all the constraints on every table, truncates every table, inserts all the data again, and then turns the constraints back on. So it takes care of all the foreign keys and everything, and it works like a dream. Yeah? How about performance in that case? It's I'm, a, I'm DBA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. not developer. But the, the performance of doing that? Yes. It, it's, uh, I honestly don't know how long it takes. Nobody's ever complained. <laughs> And it doesn't, and it's and it's happening during a deployment. Creating constraints is really expensive for people. But, but it's not, but it's not happening to a user, right? It's not, it's not like I'm a user trying to use the database and I'm getting bad performance. It's happening during a deployment, which could be happening, you know, if the deployment takes a few minutes, then nobody tends to get too upset about it. So it's not the reputation. If you have reputation, you want more. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, interesting. We do a different because of that. Okay. Yeah, like I said, there's lots of ways to do it. That's just one example that I know of. Um, there are lots of ways to do it. But um, try to think to yourself, though, for those code tables, you're better off to, to try and make it that it's, it's foolproof. It'll work on an empty database. It'll work on a full database. Because then you don't have to worry about it. You, you, know, you never have to go and touch that thing again if you don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. In, um, I like to write a lot of idempotent scripts because then I can hand them off, and if they run it twice, I don't care. Right. It's idempotent. Right. In a, most circumstances, I prefer doing differences rather than the merge mm -hmm. because dash dash, and I just see what's going to get inserted, and I can review. I just comment out the insert at the top, yeah. right, and I see what the differences are, and I go, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, right, remove it and run. Yeah. Um, but you got to be able to handle. I mean, you got to think. So version, you know, there's a version coming up, and I'm gonna. We 
We're going to add a new province. Nunavut just became a province, so we're going to add Nunavut to the province table there. It's going to get a province flag on it. And we misspelled Newfoundland. So we're going to update one. Right? So you got to you got to be able to right. That's going to be two rows that fail the difference. They're not identical. So as long as you compare the, the so the diff is going to compare every column. Right. Right. Okay. Yep. Well, or not. I mean, it depends on the use case. Yeah. 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 And that type of circumstance. Um. So anyway, so I've got um. So you can I go in here. You can see the change. Uh, actually, if I click on it, uh, let me make some space here. If I click on the store procedure. Uh, it actually shows me the difference, right? So it actually gives me a little diff between the two, which is kind of nice. And the table, no, oh, well, yeah, the table doesn't exist. So it, it'll always give me uh, a little plus sign or an X if it's so if it's in if it's not in the source but it is in the target, then you're going to get an X. Hey, should I be deleting this or is there something wrong? But it's just a good validation of, of what's going to happen. Um, I can hit update and update right from here. I can do my update. I can, I can flip these uh, and flip the comparison the other way. So now I'm, my database is the source and version control. So this is that whole idea that I was talking about with the, the schema. So now it's saying, oh, I got a, there's a table and called provinces that you should probably delete from the target because it doesn't exist over there. Um, and inside this tool, there's a whole bunch of options that you can set. So you can tell it to ignore certain things. Like when you do this on a database, you're going to get all kinds of stuff show up, like all your permissions and you know roles and users and all kinds of stuff that you probably don't care about, uh, depending on the database you're pointing at, because you may not be storing that stuff in um, in your project. So you can go come in here and turn stuff off that you don't want, and it'll just ignore that stuff. Um, and speaking of that, the other thing that we can do is we can create, if I go to the project and say publish, um, you can create a publish profile. So see this little create profile button here? I can create a publish profile. And I've already created one. So it's called the Northwind Publish XML. And I'm going to open that up and go into advanced. There we go. So these are all options that you can set. I'm not going to pretend that I understand all these. I do not. If anybody wants to explain some of them to me, I would love to talk to you. Um, but there's a bunch of stuff in here. Um, so there's a bunch of advanced deployment options. Uh, you can do things like block incremental deployment if data loss is going to occur. So it tries to do the deployment. If there's going to be data loss, it stops it. Then you look at the release. You go, oh, well, it, oh of course, because we're going to have data loss. And then you know, you can either change the option and go, yeah, we don't care, we know, turn it off and let it go, or deal with it however you're going to deal with it. But it can at least catch stuff like that. Um, what to do about drops? So, in other words, if the object isn't in here, should I be dropping it over there? Do you want to just drop objects in your database? Is that okay with you? So you can tell it if that's okay or not. Um, and then you can also tell it to just ignore certain objects, um, or, yeah, or sorry, exclude certain objects. So, has anybody ever looked at has anybody ever looked at the, the tools um, SQL package on exe and looked at the help in MSDN and how many parameters there are that you can pass to that thing? It's pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages, and they're pretty much represented on this dialog in one way or another. Okay. Um, the other thing that I can do in here is register as a data tier application. So this is kind of interesting what happens when I do this. When I deploy uh, my, app, my database, if it's registered as a data tier application, what will happen is in the master table, first of all, it'll take the version number that I set on the DAC pack and, a, and put it into a table in the master database. So I know what version it is. It also stores a version of the DAC pack. And that way, when I go to deploy the next time, it can compare the database to the last DAC pack you deployed and let you know if there's been any database drift. Does it rely on that ID for that? The ID, what do you mean? Uh, do you have a version number? No, no, it's comparing to, um, let me open my whiteboard. 
So, um, so I've got a database sitting out there, and I've got my what I'm deploying to it. So I create a DAC pack, which is my binary representation of my database, and I use that to deploy. Right. So that's when I de when I deploy that to the database, then the database schema is now at that version. It's it's the same as that DAC pack. That's my presumption, right? So it takes that DAC pack and it stores it in the database. Stores the DAC pack. That's my understanding. Is it takes the DAC pack and it stores it in the master database somewhere, somewhere in the database, or with the database. Now, the next time I go to do a deployment, before it says, "Oh, okay, you got changes you're going to deploy," it will compare itself to the last DAC pack that was deployed. And if they're different, there's been database drift. That means somebody has come in and made a change to the database without updating source control. Oh, it, if compares, up, oh it compares the database to the internally stored database. Right. Pack. Ah, I had the wrong DAC pack. Okay, sorry. Oh, that's, okay. Yeah. Now it, okay. yeah. That makes sense. Yes. That make more sense? Yeah. yeah, this is my DAC pack. These are my changes coming in. Thank you. So, yeah. so these are my changes coming in. The last time I deployed, it kept that little DAC pack there. So it's comparing itself to say, oh yeah, I'm still the same as I was the last time you deployed. So go ahead. If it wasn't, there's been database drift. Right. And you can actually run a report that tells you if there's been database drift. Which just means somebody's touching my database without going through version control. It's a good thing. That's huge. I don't know, do you all look sad? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why no, do we look sad about that? <laughs> you should be really happy. Is it my drawings? That's, that's, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's very cool. It's very, very cool. Um, <clears throat> Okay, uh, right, the other thing that you're going to want to do is take this um, Northwind, uh, my, my uh, published profile, and you want to make it um, so that it copies always, because we're going to want that. I'm going to want that as part of my build artifact, so set that thing to copy always. These are the little things that you don't find out until you've tried this a few times. Okay, how are we doing so far? Make sense? Let's make sure we've covered everything off. Uh, compiling, publish profile, schema compare, unit tests. We've done all that stuff. Uh, do, do, do. We talked about the DAC version number stuff. Um, so let's do. Are we close to break? Yeah, if you're at a natural break, let's take five minutes. <laughs> I decided if I want to do my DAC pack talk first. Now let's take a break and then we'll do the DAC pack talk. Let's take five. Come back at uh, 7.35.